Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. Ever wonder just what venture capital is? VC is a form of private equity and a type of financing that investors provide to startup companies and small businesses that are believed to have long-term growth potential. And there are two ways generally that venture capitalists will make money. The first is through a management fee for the investment funds they manage, and the second is through a carried interest or a carry, which is a share of the profits earned by the company after the initial investment. And my guest today, Rachel Newman, and I met at a Forbes magazine member event in June this year. She was the main speaker and clearly understands the opaque and dazzling world of venture capital. Rachel is the founding partner of Flying Fox Ventures, an early stage venture capital firm propelling Australian and New Zealand companies across the globe. Over her career, Rachel has worked with thousands of early stage startups, including being the head of startups for Amazon Web Services, ANZ, a partner at Startmate and has enjoyed two federal government appointments distributing commercialisation and scale funding to early stage Australian companies. So I warmly welcome Rachel to the politics of everything. Thanks so much for having me, Amber. Podcasting remotely can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be. Since day one of the politics of everything, I have relied on Zencaster's all-in-one solution to make the process quick and painless, the way it should be for those of us who just love great content and want to get our ideas out into the world. If you know me, I'm obsessed with quality in terms of my guests, my sound, and everything about my show has to be great the first time. I'm time poor. It's so easy to use Zencaster. I'm not tech savvy and you don't need to be either. There's nothing to download. Just click on the link and off we go. Zencaster is all about making your podcasting experience easy and with everything from local recording to automated post-productions now in their toolkit, you don't have to leave your browser to get that episode done and done fast. I have a special offer for you and I hopefully you can experience what I have with Zencaster. Go to Zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my VIP code, the politics of everything, all lowercase in one word, to get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. How good is that? I want you to have the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. Okay, young Rachel, what did you want to be as a kid? I don't think venture capitalist is usually like something, you know, eight-year-olds think about, but did you have an idea of what you wanted to be and a kind of what's your early career story before we got to the point we're at today? You know, what's funny is that I do have a 12-year-old son and when he was eight, he told me that he just wanted to be rich and his name is Miles and he spelled it M-I-L-E dollar sign. And, uh, <laughs> I was definitely not that kid. Um, so maybe, you know, with him growing up with his uh, – business parents is making him run askew. But no, actually, um, funny enough, I wanted to be a marine biologist and that's written in my fifth grade yearbook. And I will tell you that while that is not the profession I pursued, I am obsessed with whales to this day. And just this past weekend was whale watching out in New South Wales. So love the humpback highway, love that I get to live here and see amazing marine life, but did not pursue it as a career. Oh, totally fascinating. Well, there's still time yet. You never know. Yeah, that's right. Next, next chapter. Exactly. So how did you wind up being in this venture capital business? And as I mentioned in my intro, for a lot of people who are outside the world of startups and, and entrepreneurism, like, you know, it's a bit of an opaque kind of thing where you just see lots of money being raised in the media and so forth. But like, it's not something that people really understand how you get into. Yeah. And I'll hopefully throughout the conversation, I'll help to demystify this opacity because it's not all that mysterious or glamorous, to be honest, but I'll tell you how I got into it. And I grew up in New York, but went to university in Stanford, which is out on the other side of the country in the Bay Area of California. And as many people know, Stanford is in the heart of Silicon Valley, which in many ways is kind of the, you know, the the bedrock for the modern startup movement as well as venture capital. And so I was just lucky in that I had exposure to it at the time when we started to think about, you know, careers and and business. But I'll tell you the story. And again, this is where you can, you won't call me young Rachel anymore. You'll know that I was at 
Stanford between 99 and 03. And what was happening at that time was we had this massive uh, tech boom, which eventually became a tech bubble, and that bubble bursts all over the place. So what did that mean for- Oh, I remember that. (laughs) Yes. Well, it meant that all of my classmates in the 2000s all left Stanford to go start companies, to become millionaires on paper, to sometimes drive fancy cars around. Um, And so actually the campus was quite dead in 2000. Um, And then what was very interesting is that when that bubble burst, many of them came back to school. And uh, funny side story is that we did have a housing crisis at Stanford because we had so many students returning turning unexpectedly. But most people would look at that and have that front row seat and say, heck no, I'm not touching that world with a 10-foot pole. For me, I thought this was an incredible display of you can have super smart people who identify a really interesting problem, come up with a different way to tackle it. And then you have some crazy people who are like, yeah, go for it. And here's the money to do it. Here's the support we'll give you. Hey, it might work, it might not, but we're here with you on the journey. And I just thought, this is the world that I want to be part of, a, a world in which anything can happen, a world in which risk appetite is high, but then managed, a way in which capital can be used to make something really important in the world come to life. And so there's a bit of a full circle journey for me because immediately after Stanford, I worked for a venture fund called New Schools Venture Fund. It was founded by John Doerr, who's one of the kind of granddaddies of modern VC out of uh, Kleiner Perkins. And that was an interesting fund because it used the VC model to invest in public education in the most failing areas in in the United States. That's a a dire crisis. And so I, I worked there for many years. And then I went off and had a lot of different Uh, experiences, many of which you mentioned in my bio. But being an early days VC in Silicon Valley at that time, I learned a ton. But I also learned that I had to get out there. I had to actually run businesses. I had to get my hands dirty before I can come back and add value other than capital. So it's been really cool to come full circle. Um, But it's been one of those bookend careers where I started there as a junior burger, went off, had lots of real life experience. And now I find myself back to that passion. Absolutely. And a little fun fact, I actually in the early 2000s was living in London and I left a high, highly lucrative journalism job to join a dot com, which became a dot bomb. So I have had a front row seat and, you know, had that sort of, you know, Goldman Sachs values, values this company at 70 million, you've got your 1% sweat equity and you're earning like no money and think it's all going to be great. But I think I even then I knew what goes up must come down. And yes, it surely came down within two years pretty spectacularly. So Yeah, um, you know, it's one of those things where we did have a dot-com bubble and then we had a burst, but that's not to say there weren't plenty of winners because half of my class left at that time to go join this little company called Google or a few years later, they joined this little company called Facebook. And I don't know, they're doing pretty well for themselves. I have my 20 year reunion in October. I'll let you know just how well they're doing yeah. for themselves. Yeah. Oh gosh. I wish I had not chosen, I didn't choose any of those. I was in the arts world. So I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but Creativity that's, you know, first. <laughs> exactly. And that's, that's actually why I like being on the investment side is because one of the ways in which you manage risk is you make lots and lots of bets, right? So each one you believe has a conviction to become your Google or your Facebook, but you know that not all of them will. And so while it's different as an employee, chances are you're picking one or over the course of a you know career, maybe a handful, and you have to hope that lightning strikes in that one spot. Whereas as an investor uh, and as a VC or an LP who are the people who give me their money to invest, I'm mitigating risk in a very different way by spreading it out across a number of bets. So even when the whole bubble bursts, you have to hope that you picked one or two home runs. Absolutely. So what are some of, I guess, the general and most common tips that you give to anyone coming to you guys seeking, you know, flying fox, fixed adventures, fox adventures, you have like funding, which people must come to you all the time. Like I don't know how many emails and calls and so sort of pitches you would get in a week or a month, but I imagine there's more people wanting funding than you can possibly not just allocate, but like you say, manage the risk around. So what yeah. are some of the tips you can feedback you give to people that can help them on that early journey? Well, Amber, first I'll tell you the numbers. So we write between 10 and 15 checks a year and we see at least a thousand companies. So that just gives you an idea of the ratio, which means that we are constantly saying no to outstanding businesses. Listen, we're constantly saying no to businesses that have you know, no viability as well. But the truth is every day we have to tell someone that we aren't, aren't able to fund them, even if they have a great business, even if they're a great founder. And 
maybe those companies will go on to be very successful. And so we also have to be okay with not catching everyone. And that's also just to say that the more investors we have in the market, the better, because there's no one way to do venture. We all have our own tastes and our own investment theses. And so it's really is a matching game. So when founders are looking for investors, they should one, you know, stay positive because you will hear a lot of no's. Sometimes that no is indicative that maybe you're not onto something, but sometimes it means you just haven't found your your match yet. So I encourage people to stay as optimistic and as um, kind of systematic as they can. But I'll tell you what we look for at Flying Fox, and we've invested in 54 companies now, all in the uh, early stages. Um, so yeah, and when like you say early stages, stage. like the first like couple of years, like what's that time frame look like? So it's not it's never necessarily about time frame, just because like some companies for a few years can be stalling out and not figuring it out, and other companies within the first couple of weeks of an idea, they have something that's backable. But what we look for, and even in early stage, there is quite a bit of diversity. And by strategy, we look to have diversification even in the stages of companies. But to give you an idea, some of our portfolio literally might be pre-product, pre-revenue. So it's really an idea, but they've had some sort of MVP or minimum viable product that they've gotten in front of customers that has proven that this is a real customer problem, that the current solutions aren't good enough, and that we see that there's some sort of traction. So that's kind of on the pre-product, but that's a revenue of zero. And so we are giving them a valuation on something that's not a multiple of revenue. And then all the way on the other end, we've invested in companies that already have five or $600,000 in annual recurring revenue. Um, and they're, you know, they have a great product in market and their customers are already saying we love it. So mm. it can range, but roughly we're looking at companies that have a valuation at the, I don't know, 10 to $12 million and under. And if you think about where are they in their fundraising journey, maybe they've raised a couple hundred thousand dollars from family and friends or an accelerator program or some you know early first believers, but we would be the first firm that's coming in on their cap table. And just to go back to your earlier question, and I started to answer it uh, just now, there are three big things that I'm looking for when I get excited about an opportunity. And of course, I get excited about more opportunities than I can possibly fund. The first one is the customer problem that's being solved. And in particular, I'm looking for the founder to be able to clearly articulate this customer problem and demonstrate to me that she or he really understands it and has almost an unfair advantage in understanding it because either they've worked in that space or they've been personally impacted by this problem and they really understand the problem to be solved. The second is that that problem is in a large and growing global market. So we call that TAM or total addressable market. And again, just to have that VC level of returns, which is hopefully many, many, many times over my investment, I need to believe that this isn't a little niche product and this isn't a, pro a problem that just a handful of people feel, but it's a problem that literally millions and millions of potential customers around the world feel that. And I say around the world because Australia, while an amazing country and a country I'm proud to call home, it's usually not big enough from an, a market perspective to get those VC size return. So I am looking for companies that are solving problems that are that's global in nature and that they have the ability and the vision for how they're going to unlock that global opportunity. And then the third thing that I'm looking for comes down to like, what is this special moment in time? So we call it trends as kind of a big heading, but it's, um, you know, it has there been a massive consumer shift that all of a sudden this, you know, like COVID, you know, yeah, and all of a sudden consumer behaviors there. have changed. Yeah. Has there been a change in regulation? Is there something, you know, that is fundamentally shifting in technology, like generative AI that all of a sudden makes, makes this very exciting? So those are the three big buckets. And the only thing I would revise in that first one when I'm looking at a deep articulation of the customer problem is it's the founder, and maybe I'll say across all three of those, it's the founder's ability and either that's an individual or, you know, two or three people as a founding team, it's their ability to identify and articulate these three things, which is the customer problem, the market opportunity, and why now is an exciting time. Their ability to understand it and articulate it is a good indication of whether or not they'll be able to tackle the right things and become a magnet for great talent, great customers, and more capital like myself. So that's my job in a nutshell. 
It's a lot of hard work in there, but you've summarised that really well. Um, Obviously, the landscape has changed in the last few years. You know, we see stories more and more of, you know, money is harder to come by when it comes to venture capital. You've got things like equity crowdfunding platforms that are popping up everywhere. But, you know, we've got more startups, I guess, sometimes failing. And as a former journalist, I think I always find it interesting. There's a lot of, oh, we've raised all this money and here's this great niche, you know, kind of novel idea. We don't often talk much about the failures and I guess – it's an important part of the story really because, you know, where we are now is not where we were a few years ago and we will be somewhere else again in a few years' time and, and the economy is changing. We've got high inflation. We're talking of a recession in Australia by the end of the year. So what are some of, I guess, your insights or views of where we are right now and a little bit of a crystal ball, what you think might happen for these <laughs> businesses because it's not money for everything now and not that it always was. I'm sure you had vetting processes during the COVID times, but it did seem like anyone could raise money for anything a few years ago. Yeah. I'm going to pick this up in a few ways. So I'll talk, if you push me hard enough, I will try and crystal ball this. Although they always say, you know, like man plans, God laughs. So absolutely. And and I will never come back to you and go, hey, and Rachel said, I'm not going to do that to you. Uh, And I'll I'll talk about where we are now, but I want to zoom out and say, this is where this head full of gray hair that I have comes in handy. So I talked about uh, being in Silicon Valley during the dot-com phase and watching that bubble burst. And then I was also in New York City in business school during 07 to 09 and had a front row seat to the global financial crisis in the epicenter of, you know, finance for the world. Um, And I would literally have like, guest lecturers come to Columbia Business School. And then two days later, like that bank has vanished. So this gray hair has just given me the opportunity to see a few of these cycles up close and had this beautiful vantage point where I actually wasn't getting my hands dirty, but I got to observe how people manage through them and what strategies they deployed uh, and were successful on the other end. And so I feel very lucky in a weird way to have witnessed that. And I think that in Australia, you know, that GFC, even though we talk about it, like Australia coasted through it pretty easily nary a recession, um, and then certainly wasn't impacted like the Silicon Valley in the dot-com days. So I think that for many Australians, they actually haven't seen some of these cycles and us older investors and maybe American investors have seen them and we don't have, we have, we have more lessons learned. So well, we haven't had a recession like, in Australia for 30 plus 30 years, you know, there's yeah. t- two generations that have never experienced a recession. I unfortunately finished school when the recession happened and yeah, it was all doom and gloom. So I think lived experience is kind of an important part of this story. Yeah. And I, I think that's right. And I think that there's been a lot of hype cycles in the last few years, just like the sky is falling. Never mind, It's going to the moon. Actually, now the sky is falling. Is it really? I don't know. Maybe it's correcting. Are we at the bottom? No, we're at the top. Right. There's been. And so that's just to say, I'll, I'll tell you what I will crystal ball. I will crystal ball that there will be more and more of these up and down cycles more frequently and uh, more dramatic. And I think that's because information spreads really quickly. I think people are more reactive than ever. And I think that behavior just in general is just more short term. And so I think we'll see people have these freakouts. And so what I do uh, when I'm at my most zen and what I encourage people to do is just zoom out. If you're up really close, these changes feel like these jagged mountains and they feel really aggressively up and down. And if you zoom out, they become smoother hills over time, right? So it really has to do with the length of your aperture. So that's my one kind of old lady sage advice is just like zoom out and see the big picture. Everything is cyclical. Now, how do you actually manage through it? Um, What I learned from watching people in kind of 2000 to 2002 and 07 to 09 is those with a consistent strategy and deploy those who are able to deploy a consistent strategy both before, during, and after are the ones who won. And I feel really lucky because I invest at the very early stages. So we were the least impacted by that absolute froth of 2021 that you described, and therefore we're least impacted by the correction. We also have the longest way to go before we need a positive outcome. So usually they say seven to 10 years for that first investment to come good. And you can imagine that if we're having some gnarly macro headwinds, you have to hope that within a 10-year time frame, we'll be out, right? That's and a long time for some people, I think, you know, it's to hang a real in there. long time. Yeah. So. And so this is where like the steady patient hand wins. And this is not about day trading, right? We have a highly illiquid asset class. And so if you have an illiquid asset class that is high risk, high return by nature, then you need to have this the uh, constitution that uh, goes along with it. 
which is when things get crazy, you need to steady. When things are good, you need to stay steady. So don't get too washed up in the hype and don't get too discouraged by the downfall. You need to have a steady, steady hand. And this is what I tell my investors. Um, I show a slide that I've been using for four years, which was our strategy. And I said, I'm proud to say that while some of our tactics have changed a little bit just to stay competitive as things change, our strategy has remained the same. And we know exactly how we're going to invest in this asset class. We know exactly how we're going to get liquidity and returns for our investors. And those things, those fundamentals aren't changing. So that's just to say... In 10 years, you'll know if I'm right or or not. (laughs) Um, So hopefully the one thing I crystal ball for you is that I was right. uh, And then I have incredible outcomes for my founders and for my investors. But VC is funny because we're being asked sometimes to react to very short-term stimuli, but we have a very long-term investment. And so not everyone, I think is built for that. Absolutely. So just to, to tap into that idea a little bit further, all very well, we understand how to, you know, what your criteria to, to invest into a particular business or idea or founder founders might be. What about pulling the pin? How do you know when it's time to kind of say, hey, we've got this long-term vision, but things haven't worked out or there's just some sort of, I don't know, plethora of activity which has changed that means yeah. that you no longer, you know, feel like this is a good marriage per se. Yeah. So here's the thing. There are a few ways that you can pull the pin. Sometimes you pull the pin when things are great. So not always is it doom and gloom. And especially as an early stage investor, sometimes a company could be shooting to the moon, but I might have an opportunity to take some of my equity off the table or sell down completely and give my investors a really great return. And so part of my job is to pick great companies, but another part of my job is to manage those investments. And sometimes management means getting my investors their money back at ideally a very high multiple, and taking that money off the table. So where there are opportunities to do that, like in 2021, when everything was going frothy, we had one company that raised at a very large valuation. We were able, because the lead investor, which was a US firm at that time, wanted to gobble up as much ownership as possible, we were able to take a small amount off the table. We returned that to our investors at a 12.8x return in just 18 months, and we still have plenty of skin in that company as you know as we continue. So there are opportunities to have these liquidity events even for our great companies. Now the ones that fail, I think that's what the question was about. Or the ones that aren't going to be the canvas and the well, that's what I mean. Like I think I think sort of like we're looking very like I'm being very binary. I'm like you know it's going to be a winner or a loser. It's just much more like sometimes it might be a little bit more nuanced than that, and it just maybe time to let go. You know. Well, we believe first of all that there is a lot more nuance. I think traditionally venture thinks about the world like you said in zeros or heroes. You're either a, a unicorn or we let you wither on the vine. At Flying Fox, we have a very different approach because we have a large portfolio and because we've invested very early, we believe there's this whole, we call it the valuable middle, which is dozens of companies that might not be the billion dollar plus success stories, but probably are very attractive to for an acquisition in the 50 to 150 or $250 million valuation. And in venture, I know it sounds crazy, a $200 million exit is not exciting for a big fund. But if I got in when that company was valued at 5 million, that's a pretty significant multiple. And so because I'm in so early and because I have such a big portfolio and we happen to have skills in my investment partner, Kylie Fraser, it was an M&A lawyer for 20 years and I was uh, on the private equity team at Bain. Like We actually know how to sell companies. We believe that we're going to create quite a bit of value in getting early liquidity and early meaning five to seven years, not waiting necessarily seven to 10 for it to shoot through the moon for these companies that are going to be solid, maybe even, dare I say, cash flow positive companies that are highly attractive to larger corporates because of the tech, the talent, the differentiated customer experience that we believe will be able to get those exits. So we we like saying that we're a bit different to other venture firms. Again, going back to that earlier comment that there's no one way to do this. There are lots of different ways to be an investor, but we believe that we will have solid returns in a shorter time frame by getting these exits for companies that traditional VC might have let wither on the vines. But we say, hey, you're not going to be a Canva, but before you become a zombie, like let's find a great home for you. Now, then there are the companies that truly are going to be zombies. And that's never 
a fun conversation, but often the market tells them before we have to. Yeah. And the market tells you in a few ways. Either your customers just aren't buying what you're selling, and that just means that you haven't honed in on a customer problem that is painful enough or a solution that is good enough, or you're going out to raise capital and the market just isn't investing behind you. And so sometimes that's, again, your customers of the market externally is just saying, you know, sorry, this just isn't right for this right time, or this isn't right for this asset class. And of course, there are lots of different ways that companies can be successful and lots of different ways companies can raise capital that aren't VC. So that's where all of a sudden, choose your own adventure. Maybe we we start to look at some different roads. And of course, the gender question, you know, female founder businesses, particularly in Australia, receive less than 2% of all that VC money that might be out there. And that's despite, I mean, you guess, proof in the pudding, runaway success stories like your Canvas or Modi Body, proving there's big returns for investors in female-led startups. But still, there's this resistance is there any kind of reasoning still or is it just a like inherent bias? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's inherent bias. So at Flying Fox, we buck the trend in that 38% of our capital is behind female founders. And I think that that becomes just our unfair advantage because if you believe that talent is equally distributed, but there's just bias and barriers to access for women, the fact that great women find great women or that we're getting to see them first, that just that's, that's our unfair advantage. And actually, when we cut our on-paper uh, returns for our portfolio, companies that are founded by women on paper are showing a stronger, just slightly, but a stronger return profile than our male-founded companies, which is pretty cool. So one, I think, that, yeah, there's total, like just absolute structural bias. There's a whole bunch of other stuff, which would be, I think, a whole, a different podcast altogether. But I'll just say that um, we were very lucky. We just got a grant from Launch Vic, which is the uh, startup agency for the state of Victoria that gave us $300,000 to launch a pre-accelerator for female founders. And this is taking women at the earliest stage of ideation and helping them to have the competence and the confidence and the network they need to bring those ideas to fruition. And we're doing it for a few reasons. One, it's the right thing to do, right? It's like unreasonable that we don't have more female founders, that they're getting underfunded at that unbelievable disparity. Two, we, again, want to unfairly be the ones that see these incredible founders first. So it's where those like values and unbelievable untapped value kind of come together. And so we'll be able to see these companies from day dot. And so we're really excited to be kicking that program off the first week of September. But what I was going to say is that we it came out of necessity as well. So not only do we want to see them, but we're looking at our numbers. And I told you we see a thousand companies a year when we look at the top of our funnel, month after month for the last two years, the number of women that are coming through our pipeline of potential deals has been dwindling. Yeah. And so even we with 38% behind female founders in the last 12 months, that's gone down to 20%. And so we're seeing it go down. So we're doing everything we can to keep that birth rate up. Because if we can keep that birth rate up, then we know that the quality is there. So we need more great female founded companies being born. I want to cherry pick the best ones of off course the top you do. <laughs> and uh, back them all the way to success. So when ideally does a founder need to let go and maybe let others go into the driver's seat or just exit the business? You know, is there usually a few signs or is it kind of hard to kind of generalize about that process? Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to generalize. And um, the beautiful part about this job is we just are constantly getting surprised by, you know, founders. I should say that when we're investing in founders, we're looking at what is her or his current expertise, but can we squint our eyes and seeing them be an incredible leader for a large enduring business? And can we see them having the kind of learning orientation and neuroplasticity and this like high velocity feedback loop kind of mentality and systems so that they are constantly growing with the job because their job is going to change many times over from potentially, you know, engineer, writing a first lines of code to all of a sudden having to hire a team to running fundraising, right? Like that role changes. And so we're always betting on that founding team being able to grow with that role. Sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we get it wrong. And so when you get it wrong, that's when you start to think about as the company grows, what is are these founders' highest and best uses? And where are there gaps on the team that we can plug with other talent. And then we, the best part of our job is when we're absolutely pleasantly surprised when someone we think has a pretty 
narrow skill set and we just watch her or him grow so beautifully in the role and really thrive in areas that they hadn't had experience before. But that's just to say it's really important when we're looking at founders that we're looking for a bunch of these, not technical skills, but these attitudinal behaviors around them being fast learners because, gosh, they're going to have to learn so much in this journey and how to be a leader, how to identify what the, the business needs as a leader, then how to be that person or in some instances hire that person is a mission critical skill set. Absolutely. You give loads of advice to to obviously founders and other people in your network. What's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given and why? So I don't know if this was meant to be advice, but it has become advice. I think it was actually meant to be some constructive feedback, if you will. But I had a manager uh, when I was at Eventbrite and he said, you know what, Rachel, sometimes you, he actually got up on the whiteboard and he drew a picture of a brick wall and like a gingerbread man in the middle. And he said, sometimes you blow Rachel size holes through things and people. And I thought, okay, you know, feedback taken. What I think what he was saying was like, be careful on how you throw yourself up against a problem. And certainly I've worked on managing, you know, my style or figuring out how to get through or around the wall without blowing a hole the size of me. And then it was like, a have always remembered that moment. And a few years later, I reflected on, it. I was like, a Rachel size hole through problems that other people see as a brick wall is like a pretty cool thing. And so I use it as actually a positive, which is, I am uniquely able to problem solve and to blow through obstacles that other people see as fixed. And I do it uniquely in my own style. And so that shape of that hole will look like me. And there are times where you just need to do that. And you can't, it, it's not about being apologetic. It's not about, you know, building a whole team and we're slowly dismantling the wall brick, brick, brick by brick. Sometimes the best way is to just blow a freaking hole through it um, and do it in your style. Uh, with the strengths that you've developed and the skills that you've developed over time. So that's like one of those double-edged advice. <laughs> it's so like it comes just in as a criticism out. in a way, but you've turned it into something which has served you by the sounds of it. Yeah, I think so. You know, it, it's, and I think anytime someone gives you feedback or advice, there's probably, so if someone gives you feedback, there's probably advice on the other side of that. And if someone gives you advice, there's probably feedback on the other side. So that was one of those things where I think he was like, giving me a bit of a dressing down. And I was like, cool, I hear that. And I know exactly what I need to do to make you feel less abused by the size of me <laughs> and my uh, fervor. But on the other hand, like I do what I do because I'm me and I can, you know, work around the edges. Like it's like I could change some of my tactics, but my the, the strategy of Rachel, like that's a pretty formidable thing. So have we spoken in a year's time, Rachel, what would be your number one big hairy goal to have achieved? And just quickly explain why it's so important. Oh, I mean, the very tactical answer is that right now we're raising a fund and this is the first time we've been running these annual funds to date. And we've got, we have about $30 million of assets under management that we have uh, deployed through these annual funds. This is the first time that we're raising kind of a big chunky fund that will be deployed over a number of years and is a big amount of funds raised at once. And so I'd like to just say I've closed that fund, but I, I want to talk about what that represents. So closing the fund represents, first of all, that we will have a huge chunk of capital that allows us to continue to double down on those companies that we have invested in and that we have this asymmetric information and we know who is on a great journey. Right now, we have an amazing way to get that first check in, but this means we'd have a bigger pool of capital to double down on our winners. So that first and foremost, that ability. It also just means that we can look at our founders and say, we're with you for the distance, not just emotionally and through support, but like, we're going to keep giving you the capital you need to, to run towards your, you know, your moonshot. So that's what it represents. One, it represents that we will be the largest female run firm in Australia. Right now we are the most active female run firm. Um, and so this will just be an amazing opportunity for women allocators to have access to that capital. So you mentioned how few women receive venture capital, even fewer 
are actually deploying it. And I think it's really important that we have more women making decisions around where this capital is deployed. And it will also just be a vote of confidence from our existing investors of whom we have over 400 over the years, as well as new investors, that they recognize that we are absolute experts in our field and that we are making a long-term commitment to each other for the next decade, uh, that we are going to be custodians of their capital and they have high confidence that we're going to give it back to them many, many, many times over. So I hope that that is what I'll be able to say to you in a year, that we've closed our fund and we're actively deploying it. But I hope people understand what that means for us and why. Great explanation. Just a final takeaway message for us today on the politics of business scaling. Yeah. For, for you scaling or for others? or Anyone. I think for anyone out there who's listening is like, this is great, Rachel. This sounds like something <laughs> I, you know, I could play in this field, but I'm, you know, I just don't know where to start or I yeah. kind of, you know, I've got had some setbacks. What would be your message for everyone listening? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'll say, and we started at the top of this call about this opacity or this, you know, mystique around startups and uh, venture capital. So first of all, this space is for everyone. Everyone can start a business. Everyone can deploy capital or start investing in startups. There are lots of different ways to get involved. So one, this is not something you need a special degree in. Of course, there are things that you can learn and ways that you can manage your risk and you can get smart right on this. But I want everyone to know that they belong here. And so if you want to start a company, you know, come look at the F4 female founder program that we're running or lots of other accelerators like Startmate or Techstars, like just get out there and start learning. There are lots of resources online and now ChatGPT can practically throw together an idea and you have no code tools. You can build an MVP very quickly. So if you have an idea, just get started. And then likewise, if you're interested in this asset class and want to start deploying some capital, there are lots of different ways, no matter how little or how much money you want to put in, there is a place for you to to get that money in the hands of incredible companies who are doing great things. So that's just a call to action. Everyone gets started and there is a whole community and a whole world of resources available for you to learn along the way. Fabulous to hear from you today, Rachel. And of course, you do want to connect further with Rachel Newman or hear more about what her business does. There will be some details on the show notes. Until next time, take care. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.